the hymn number 61. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes. Most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. God said to men, to be wise, you must worship the Lord. To understand, you must turn from evil. You didn't come here tonight to be entertained. You've got a television at home and could have found better entertainment there. Nor did you come here tonight to be educated there are places of greater learning than this. There are universities and schools and colleges for you to go to and night classes during the week. But if you want to be wise, then you came to the right spot tonight. For this is the place where wisdom is to be found. Not entertainment, not education. Because you can get to heaven without either of those two things. But wisdom is to be found when you worship God and when you turn from evil. Immortal, invisible, God, only wise. There's only one wise person in the entire universe and we've come here to meet him. Let's talk to him now. God, only wise. We want to confess that we're very silly people and that we need your help. And it's only when we come into your presence and worship you and see life in true perspective that we realize what silly people we are. How silly we are to set 
so much of our affection on things that are going to pass away, leaving us only the poorer. How silly we are to worry about things that to you are nothing, and thus to libel your care of your children. How silly we are, Lord, to fill our minds with trash, which in the long run will not help us anywhere. How silly we are to look after our bodies so carefully and to neglect our souls. How silly we are to stuff our minds with anything we can read in the papers, in the magazines, in the books, and not soak our thinking in your words. How silly we are to forget that we must die and that this life is only a school for something much larger. And so we confess, Lord, that we need to be made wise. Some of us may be intelligent and others simple. Some of us may be clever and others not. But, Lord, we are all silly, and we all need your wisdom. We want to thank you for Jesus Christ, who is our wisdom. And that because he is God, he also is only wise. And we praise you for the sheer wisdom of his words. But we thank you too for what he was. And we pray that tonight we will know what it is to be made a little wiser. That the only life you've given to us, a life which is rushing by so quickly and slipping from our grasp, that we may make the most of that life may be sensible in our use of next week, of the time and the money that you give to us, of the health that is your blessing, of the opportunities of relationship and conversation which society affords. Lord, make us wise in these things. In some of the deep questions that perplex us, in some of the difficult decisions we have to make, Lord, we need your wisdom, or else we're going to make fools of ourselves. And you didn't intend us to live on earth as fools. And so, Lord, thank you for giving us not only life itself, but the vital clues that we needed to its meaning. Thank you for giving us not only minds that ask the right questions, but thank you in Jesus for the right answers. And we pray that the spirit of truth may teach us tonight and that in this service every one of us may learn where wisdom is to be found. Oh, how we search the earth, how we dig for more oil beneath the waves, how we look for uranium. And Lord, you wanted us to look for wisdom. So thank you that we've come to the place where it may be found. We worship you, the God who made us, the God who has truth within himself, the God who wants to make us wise. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our wisdom and our salvation. Amen. We're studying the book of Ecclesiastes. We have reached chapter 7. It's on page 653 in the Good News Bible. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. I'm going to read the first 25 verses. I'm not chickening out on the last bit of it, where it says, I have looked for other answers but have found none. I found one man in a thousand that I could respect, but not one woman. Well, we'll take that next Sunday evening. And I'll try and tell you why he said that. We'll just take the first 25 verses of chapter 7 tonight. A good reputation is better than expensive perfume. And the day you die is better than the day you are born. It is better to go to a home where there is mourning than to one where there is a party. Because the living should always remind themselves that death is waiting for us all. Sorrow is better than laughter. 
It may sadden your face, but it sharpens your understanding. Someone who is always thinking about happiness is a fool. A wise person thinks about death. It is better to have wise people reprimand you than to have stupid people sing your praises. When a fool laughs, it is like thorns crackling in a fire. It doesn't mean a thing. When a wise man cheats someone, he is acting like a fool. If you take a bribe, you ruin your character. The end of anything is better than its beginning. Patience is better than pride. Keep your temper under control. It is foolish to harbor a grudge. Never ask, oh, why were things so much better in the old days? <laughs> it's not an intelligent question. <laughs> Everyone who lives ought to be wise. It is as good as receiving an inheritance and will give you as much security as money can. Wisdom keeps you safe. This is the advantage of knowledge. Think about what God has done. How can anyone straighten out what God has made crooked? When things are going well for you, be glad. And when trouble comes, just remember, God sends both happiness and trouble. You never know what is going to happen next. My life has been useless, but in it I have seen everything. A good man may die, while another man lives on, even though he's evil. So don't be too good or too wise. Why kill yourself? But don't be too wicked or too foolish either. Why die before you have to? Avoid both extremes. If you are religious, you will be successful anyway. Wisdom does more for a person than ten rulers can do for a city. There is no one on earth who does what is right all the time and never makes a mistake. Don't pay attention to everything people say. You may hear your servant insulting you. And you know yourself that you have insulted other people many times. I used my wisdom to test all of this. I was determined to be wise, but it was beyond me. How can anyone discover what life means? It is too deep for us, too hard to understand. But I devoted myself to knowledge and study. I was determined to find wisdom and the answers to my questions and to learn how wicked and foolish stupidity is. Listen to some of the things men have said about life. It is not that we don't get what we want. The tragedy of life is that we don't know what we want. Life has no reason as struggling through the gloom and the senseless end of it is the insult of the tomb. That's a modern poet. Here's another writer of today. What good is faith when there is nothing to believe in? What good is hope when there is nothing to hope for? And what good is love when the world only understands hate? Another writer. The trouble is that everybody is alive but nobody's living. We are all a bunch of zombies going through the motions of life. Samuel Butler said life is one long process of getting tired. Thomas Carlyle said the tragedy of life is not so much what men suffer, but rather what they miss. Voltaire said life is a bad joke. And Shakespeare said life is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Well, having cheered you up, let's now turn to Ecclesi Ecclesiastes. For the writer of this unusual book in the Old Testament was determined to be able to say something better than that. 
he was asking the right questions and groping with all his energy and with all his thought for the right answers. He was asking, is life really worth living? What is it all about? Why am I here? Is there any point to life? And that famous phrase, vanity of vanities, everything is vanity. To translate that into modern English, we have to say life is pointless. And one of the tragedies of this book, Ecclesiastes, is that he never quite got to the point. However, in the second half of the book, he got nearer to it than he did in the first half, which should cheer you up. In the first half, we have an atmosphere of cynicism, disillusion, even despair. He's tried the avenue of education and found it to be a dead end. He's tried the avenue of pleasure, and that too is a cul-de-sac. He's tried the avenue of wealth, and last Sunday night I gave you his conclusions on that, and they are pretty disturbing. He'd come to the conclusion that none of these avenues really produced an answer to life. And so in chapter 7 he turns to something else and now he begins to be more positive. He turns from wealth to wisdom. And he comes to the conclusion that a wise man is better off than a wealthy man. That's progress. That's a little halting step forward towards the answer which he never found but which we have found in Jesus Christ. But it's lovely to see a man starting from his own premises, starting from an observation of life as he sees it, starting from the utter integrity and honesty which very few people have, being prepared to admit that these were dead ends and that he was getting nowhere fast. Starting from there, we see his first halting steps towards a better life. A man seeking to better himself. A man who is asking who is better off. And you've got the key word now, haven't you, from the reading. You probably got it while we read. It is better. It is better. It is better. Here's a man who's at least beginning to make some value judgments and beginning to say that kind of life is better than this kind of life. I can begin to tell you something positive. And he does it by showering upon us a series of proverbs. Now proverbs are very wonderful things. They're a way of distilling human experience into a pithy, picturesque phrase which is so easily remembered that wisdom can be passed down through the generations. Now you know plenty of proverbs. Let's have a few from you. <laughs> Didn't ask for a laugh, I asked for proverbs. Yes? Many hands make light work. Let's have a... Too many cooks spoil the broth. A few more. A bird in the hands with two in the bush. Stitch in time saves nine. All that glitters is not gold. Sorry? Pride goes before a fall. Another one? Look before you leap. He who hesitates is lost. The modern version of that is, he who hesitates is ten miles from the next exit. I like that one. <laughs> Let's have another one. Are there any more? Fine. Well, now look, we've just had a selection. You remember those without any difficulty. And they distill the essence of wisdom over many generations. Of course, if you just quote them, that's, that's no help to you at all. But if you live by them, you'll be a wiser man than if you ignored them. And these proverbs come down to us. Now, God has sanctified this form of literature, a proverb. Indeed, there's a whole book in the Bible called the book of Proverbs. But there are proverbs all the way through. Jesus was always quoting them. Paul quotes them. And here are some right in the heart of Ecclesiastes. They're so picturesque. They're so memorable. Take the first as a marvelous example. A good reputation is better than expensive perfume. You like that one? Do you understand what it's saying? It's saying this. Everybody wants to make a good impression on other people. Everybody wants to be attractive. Everybody wants to be popular. Now there's a quick way and that is to get expensive per perfume and put it on. Canal number five or whatever. <laughs> or if you're a man, some brutish concoction. <laughs> That's the quick way to make people like you. The slower way, but the better way, is to have a good reputation. 
the world is trying to say if you want to be attractive then have a bath and all sorts of things happen after you've had a bath in this stuff and if you study advertising, advertising saying the expensive perfume is the way to make yourself attractive and the aftershave is the key to success. And this, this man looks, this man looks at life and he says if you really want other people to be drawn towards you then see that you have a good reputation. That's very profound wisdom in a sentence. And it's just the lie to so much commercial advertising that you're subjected to. When did you last see an advertisement suggesting that you built up a good reputation so that other people would find you attractive? It's a little pithy proverb. Now one commentator says that first proverb hardly prepares us for the, the body blow of the second. The day you die is better than the day you were born. How many of you can remember the day you were born? I mean the date. Can you remember the date? Date of your birth? Most of you. How many of you have ever thought about the year of your death? Just a handful. Just think about it for a moment now. Just have a guess what year you will die. You can perhaps have a rough guess. Think about it. Let's just assume you've got three score years and ten. What year are you going to die? Think about it. Some of you will need a pocket calculator, but try, <laughs> try and think about it. Right, have you thought? If you're going to live three score years and ten, do you now know what year you're going to die? Put your hand up if you know now. Some of you are slow at mathematics. <laughs> or else you're very reluctant to think about the day you die. And it is a fact that we celebrate our birthdays, but the last thing we want to do is to start calculating the day we die. I've done a few calculations here. I assume that I'm going to live 72 years, which is just slightly above the average, but it made the maths a little easier. <laughs> and I'm going to assume, secondly, that my life is a day of 24 hours from midnight to midnight. Therefore, what time of day is it for me? And here are the results. If you are 18 years of age, it is 6 o'clock in the morning for you. If you're 27 years of age, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. If you're 36, you're at high noon. If you're 45, it is already 3 o'clock in the afternoon. If you are 60, it's 8 o'clock in the evening. Do you find that disturbing? And Ecclesiastes says that's the sort of thinking that does you good. But it's the sort of thinking that the world runs right away from. And indeed there may be those who will go away from this service tonight saying he just set out to depress us. There was a saintly Christian who used to sleep with a skull by his bed. And he did it because the Bible says it is better for you to think about the day you will die than the day you were born. Why? I'll tell you why. Because birth is so welcome to us. It's such a lovely event that birth is surrounded by fantasy and fancy. A baby is born and we all lean over the pram and say goo goo and, and it's... it's <laughs> It's all a dream world. We don't stop to think that that baby is going to die. We don't stop to think that that baby has been born a sinner. We don't stop to think of all the trouble that life is going to get into. We live in a kind of euphoria. What a sweet little baby as if this is a perfect little life that's come into the world. And we're so thrilled. Birth never teaches you to ask the right questions. But think about your death. Go into a funeral house and you think about the right questions. You ask the right questions of life. If birth leads people into a cloud cuckoo land of fantasy, it is death that leads them into the real world of fact. And the greatest fact of life is death. And you're a fool, says this book, if you don't think about it. Indeed, he says, sorrow is better for you than laughter. And a man who's always thinking about happiness is a fool. Would you agree with his statements here? 
I'm going to tell you shortly that Jesus taught exactly the same truths and that sorrow is a good deal better for you than happiness. Or we could put it another way. Is it not true that prosperity reveals your vices and adversity brings out your virtues? Is that not true? Is it not also true that people are more likely to pray at a funeral than at a party? Is it not true that festivals are designed to stop you thinking and crowd your mind with so many thoughts that you do not ask the right questions, whereas a funeral brings such thought with it that it is so often drowned with a ham tea afterwards? I've talked to people after funerals and the last thing they want to discuss is the day of their death. The sooner they get on with the ham sandwiches, the better they get away from the reminder and even death itself is dressed up. I come from the north of England where until quite recently it was the custom for little children to be lifted up to see grandpa in his coffin. In the south I notice we whisk the remains away out of sight. Something not quite nice. And death has become the great unmentionable subject in the Victorian age sex was the untalked of thing now death is and we're frightened of it but if I say to myself I'm somewhere ab around 25 to 4 in the afternoon that's helpful to me that will make me think the right kind of thoughts that will bring me to sober understanding of life and so that's the second group of proverbs funerals are better than festivals and sorrow is better for you than happiness one of the great puzzles I have in life is this, and it began very early with me as a child, and that is why are the things that are good for you things that you don't like, and things that are bad for you things that you enjoy? Have you had that problem? The quickest way to put your child off eating something is to say, it's good for you. Their immediate reaction is, then there must be something bad tasting about it, and I'm not going to eat it. But as has been pointed out, there are many sweet things in this world that are poison and there are many bad tasting things that are medicine. And here is a man who's lived long enough to decide the difference. The third group of proverbs he throws at us concerns fools and wise men. And he says, keep out of the company of fools. There is flattery there, there is fun there, but neither do you any good. The flattery doesn't do you any good. It is much better to have a wise man tell you that there's something wrong with you than to have a fool flatter you. But which do we prefer? Likewise, he says, the laughter of fools is like thorns under the pot. I don't know if you've ever lit a bonfire and put thorns on it. If you have, you will know what he means. Thorns blaze up quickly and they pop. Each thorn is like a bubble that expands and pops and it cracks and it blazes up cracks and within minutes it's gone you don't get a lasting fire with thorns it blazes up and it goes snap crackle pop and it's gone and this man says that's the laughter of fools they blaze up they cackle away in the laughter and it's gone you don't get any permanent warmth in that kind of fellowship it's the cocktail party laughter that hollow laughter that is so quickly gone keep out of the company of fools there is flattery there there is fun there but the fun is so fading and the flattery will do you more harm than good then he moves on to an area which is now our way of life John has mentioned the corruption in Zaire and I know that that is a good deal worse than the corruption here but don't let's fool ourselves we're heading that way fast the Lockheed scandal broke on us a few months ago but have you counted how many such things have been revealed since the Range Rovers at British Leyland the Polson affair blazing up again like a fire that hasn't been put out the Scotland Yard inspectors in court at this very moment we are living in a society where bribery is becoming the order of the day and you've got to slip a backhander if you want the job a man who runs a little wayside restaurant told me that 
He can only get coach loads to stop there by bribing the drivers with about half his profit. And if he doesn't slip the driver his bribe, then the driver just takes the coach pass to someone who will. And this is spreading insidiously into almost every area of life and we are getting rapidly to the point where unless you pay through the nose, unless you pay the backhander, then you're just not going to get the job. And a man interviewed for stealing radios from British Leyland. He put one radio in the car and one in his pocket each day. He was asked, do you think that's stealing? And he said, no. The company directors have their perks and this is mine. It's not stealing. He would count it stealing if he took it from an old lady, but if you take it from British Leyland, that's not stealing. It's just part of the job. And this writer says, you know, I've looked at this and I've seen that a man who takes a bribe or pays one pays a terrible price for that. The price he pays is that he's sold himself. He's sold himself. He has sold his integrity for that bribe and that's too big a price to pay. You are selling your character for that hard cash. Which is better? He said it's better to have character than cash. And that's a value judgment that we need to listen to because we are all getting caught up in it. And finally he moves on to life's injuries and insults and makes the very sound point that it's better to be a patient person than a proud person because a proud person gets hurt and a proud person gets angry and there are two forms of anger you either blow up and it comes out which is better for you but not for the other person or else it goes in and becomes a grudge and a resentment and he can see that pride is behind both temper and grudges. And he said, it's better to be patient than proud. Of course it is, but you tell me, Ecclesiastes, how? How? That's why he could tell us what is better, but he can't take us there. He can tell us that it's better to be long-suffering and let those insults go over you than either to give them back with interest immediately in, in a fit of temper or to let it harbor as a grudge. Now, do you see anything in common between all these proverbs? They seem a bit of an Irish stew up to now, don't they? They seem a real mixture. What is the thread that ties all these proverbs we've talked about together? There is one theme behind every one of these proverbs, ranging as they do from perfume to death to bribery. What is the one theme that ties them together? Has anybody seen it? Put your hand up if you've seen the one thing common to them all. Not yet. Well, they're all wisdom, yes, but what is the particular teaching here? The principle, pardon? They're all contrary to popular belief, or most of them are, that's true. Is, is there another thread? They all have an effect on character. All self-respect. Can I draw a thread through for you in your thinking? What's in common with all these proverbs? A stitch in time saves nine. Chickens come home to roost. All work and no play make Jack a dull boy. Marry in haste, repent at leisure. Be sure your sins will find you out. A rolling stone gathers no moss. All those proverbs have the same thing in common with these. What is it? You got it? A consequence for getting warm. Do you realize that the thread that draws them all together is this? That wisdom is living for the future rather than the present. Do you get that thread? Or to put it another way, that a wise man always considers the long-term consequences rather than the short-term. A man who takes a bribe is living for the present, not the future. He's better off in the present, but he's going to be worse off in the future, and he's living on a short term. Do you understand it? A stitch in time saves nine. That's saying live in the long-term, consider the long-term consequences. Marry in haste, repent at leisure. Don't think of the present, think of the future. And a wise man is someone who takes a longer look at life. A silly man is a man who lives for the present. I would call it the Esau syndrome. Jacob and Esau, two men, and one lived for the long term and one lived for the short term. And the man of faith is the man who lives for the long term. And Esau comes home and he says, I'm famished, I want a plate of soup now. 
I don't care what you ask me for it. I don't care what I barter for it. Give me some soup now. The original existentialist living for the now. And Jacob said, fine, you can have my soup. I would just like your birthright when dad dies. And Esau handed it over. What a silly fool. And when the will came, Jacob got the money, not Esau. And it was all over a plate of soup. And yet, if you laugh at Esau, if you consider him to be a fool, how many fools are there in Guildford who are exchanging eternal glory for a night's telly tonight? What fools. To live on such a short-term basis. And so, a good reputation is better than expensive perfume. Why? Because expensive perfume lasts you 24 hours. A good reputation will last you a lifetime. The day you die is better than the day you're born because if you think about death, that will give you a long perspective and it's only when you come to die that you really see life in its true evaluation. It's only then from the light of the grave that you look back and you really see what has been worthwhile and what has been a silly waste. And so all of it is take the long-term view. I may take a bribe and I'm 50 pounds richer today but ten years from now, I'm a much poorer man because I've sold my integrity for 50 quid. Take the long view. The snag with Ecclesiastes, of course, is that he couldn't take a long enough view. He could only see as far as the end of this life, and that's not a long enough view to be wise. That's why he never finally got further than these rather trite and even trifling proverbs. But the one thing he could not stand, and he finishes this section with this, is this, a wise man lives in the future rather than the present, but he said the worst man of all is the man who lives in the past. And you laughed when I read that, didn't you? Those who say it was better in the good old days. That's even worse than a man who lives only for the present. The very worst outlook of all, the most silly outlook of all, is to yearn for the good old days. And we are passing through a wave of nostalgia just now. Have you noticed this? There's a real wave of nostalgia going through the British nation's soul at the moment. We're saying the good old days when this and that and the other. That is utterly foolish because in this case, your thinking has become a substitute both for action and for thought. Because while you say the good old days were better, you don't do anything to mend the present. While you say the good old days were better, you're even deluding yourself and daydreaming because you always look back with rose-colored spectacles and you only remember the nice bits. If some of you older folk would like to be back in the good old days, then go back to them and lose your pension. The good old days were not good old days. We just think of them that way. A wise man is... A man who lives for the future and says, what is going to be the result of this in the long term? In other words, as we shall see when we come to chapter 12, the time to prepare for old age is during your teens. How many teenagers or how few do that? Did you do it? Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Get ready now for your old age. That's what he's going to say later to young people. But will they listen? Take the long-term view. You can see straight away as soon as you do, you change your habits. For example, you see straight away that smoking is silly and brushing your teeth is sensible. As soon as you take a long-term view, take the short-term view, and I don't need to brush my teeth and I can smoke as much as I like. Take the long-term view and the whole situation's reversed. And it's taking the long-term view that is so wise and so rare. And that's what he's saying. So that's why he says the end of anything is better than its beginning. The ultimate outcome is the better guide than the original start. It's not whether you've started something, but how you finish that matters. And any athlete would tell you that. And anybody who's done anything worthwhile would tell you this. That it's not how you start off, it's how you finish. It's not your birthday you should be thinking about, but your death day. And that's going to put life in true perspective for you. Well, now, having given us these examples of wisdom, he now moves on, and so do I, to a brief evaluation of wisdom, just how much can wisdom do for you if you manage to find it. 
He says, for example, it's better than an inheritance. Would you think that? Would you rather receive a thousand pounds or a piece of good advice? In fact, wisdom is better than an inheritance. There's a greater security. You'll be safer in your old age if you're wise than if you're rich. Would the world agree with that evaluation? He says, it's better for controlling circumstance. Wisdom can do more than ten rulers for a city. If you can get hold of wisdom, you will be able to control the situation better than ten rulers could. And I've lived just long enough to know that that's true. But there are certain drawbacks to wisdom, and we've got to face them now. The first limitation to what wisdom can do for you is that God still has the last word over your arrangements. And you need to think about this, that you have got all your plans straight in front of you and God makes it crooked. We had an example of that in this building yesterday. Yesterday there was a big celebration arranged, a rally arranged to say farewell to someone who's held a position in the Baptist denomination. And it was to be such a happy occasion and presentations had been planned and speeches and everything was beautifully planned to have a celebration. Only the gentleman who was going to be celebrated lost his young daughter on Thursday morning. And so all the plans were overruled by providence. It turned the occasion instead of a back-slapping occasion it became a triumph of grace in Jesus Christ and the man stood here before his daughter is buried and was able to share a tremendous faith in the Lord Jesus and the triumph that he'd been given and the whole family and the young husband who'd been left was there taking photographs for the occasion you see, make your plans, says Ecclesiastes. Be wise to plan for the future, but just remember that God can alter all that. Providence has the last word. You can prepare for the future, but you can't plan it. It is wise to say, if I do this, I am more likely to be better in my old age, but just remember that your old age may not turn out as you've planned. God makes a thing straight, and who can make it crooked? God makes a thing crooked, who can make it straight? Just remember that even in all your wisdom, you do not know what will happen next. It's important to realize there is this limit on wisdom. You can prepare for as many eventualities as you can see. You can think through to the ultimate outcome of your present behavior, but you cannot decide because God plans your future. So wisdom can't do everything. The second limitation is this, and here we read a passage which I'm sure you wondered about and wondered why God put it in the Bible. Don't be too good or too wise. Why kill yourself? Don't be too wicked or too foolish either. Why die before you have to? Avoid both extremes, and if you are religious, you will be successful anyway. What did you think about that? I know people who jump on that text who may not know any other, but they really jump on that and say, that's how I live in the book it's in the word of God and they shut their eyes to everything else the book says the book says be holy for I am holy the book says be perfect for your heavenly father is perfect but there are people who ignore all that and seize on this don't be too good don't go to extremes don't get religious mania everything has its proper place be a little good and everybody's got their faults and put religion in two as an insurance this is the attitude of the ordinary man who has not yet realized that life goes on beyond the grave. This is the natural, normal human wisdom that only sees this life. And the reason why he gives this rather extraordinary advice is very sound. He says, as I observe life, I can see that it doesn't pay to be good. I've seen a man who really tried so hard to be good and he died young and he died painfully. And I've seen a man who was bad and he lived on and he died peacefully in his old age. So it honestly is not worth it to try to be too good. Don't kill yourself being good because you might die anyway. That's what he's saying. 
And if the furthest you can see is the grave, then that's very sensible advice. And I can understand the ordinary man in the street saying, that's my philosophy. Try to be good, but don't, not too good. Don't go to extremes. Don't get religious mania. And don't be too bad because you're likely to get in trouble with the fuzz. Just try and, and go down the middle and add a little spice of religion to keep you out of trouble and, and you'll be successful anyway. That is worldly wisdom. But as soon as I look beyond the grave, that kind of advice is nonsense. You see, he's working within the parameters, within the limits of his observation, under the sun, before the de grave, for who knows what happens afterwards. Well, I'll tell you, God knows what happens afterwards, and God has said if you're going to get through afterwards, then the standard is perfection. And you'll never get to heaven on this advice. He's giving advice for those who are simply coping with this life, and it's reasonable advice. It's saying don't try to be over good because you might not reach, reach old age anyway. Life seems to be very arbitrary. It's reasonable advice. But as soon as life beyond the grave opens up, then this advice becomes obsolete. It's not wisdom, it's foolish. And this was his limitation. Two more limitations on wisdom and then we're through. First, don't expect to be right all the time. Everybody makes mistakes. And however wise you are, don't take yourself too seriously. And finally, don't become hypersensitive to criticism. If you are too influenced by other people's comments, then you'll soon be a nervous wreck. You'll soon be deeply hurt. Why? Because you know you've said wounding things about others which were not true. You've tried to vent your spleen against them by making a criticism. Okay, they're doing it about you too, so just don't listen to them too seriously. If a man listened too seriously to everything everybody else says about him, he would never get anywhere. And so it's wise not to go around digging up what everybody says about you. Pascal, the philosopher, said if everybody knew what each said of the other, there wouldn't be four friends left in the world. <laughs> and this is very sound advice. Don't go around digging up what other people say about you. Because uh, they're just doing to you what you've done to them. And you needn't take it too seriously. This is all good common sense stuff, but where is it getting us? I'm afraid I'm left at the end with the disappointment that he felt. And he sums it all up. He says, in my useless, pointless life, I've seen everything. I devoted myself. I was determined to get wisdom. I studied it. I wanted to find out how silly sin is. I tried to find out wisdom and foolishness. And he finally comes up with this conclusion. I found a few things that are better than other things. But he said in the last analysis, I have been unable to plumb the depths of wisdom. I have not found it. My search has not led me to wisdom. I still don't know. I believe that wisdom is the secret. I believe that this is the right path. But I can only go a tiny little step down this path. I can tell you it's better to have a good reputation than expensive perfume. But that's as far as I can take you. I can tell you that it's better to think about your death than about your birth. But that's as far as I can take you. I can tell you not to take too seriously what other people say about you. But I can't take you any further. And this poor man finishes up. I have searched and I have not found. It is too deep. There's something rather sad about this. All he can do is give us a little homespun advice about not going to extremes, not trying to be too religious. Where then is wisdom to be found? I'll tell you where it's to be found. It's yet another illustration of the fact that the Old Testament is utterly incomplete without the new. Listen now to some words of wisdom almost identical to the ones we've just read. But try and spot the difference. Jesus looked at his disciples and said, Happy are you poor, the kingdom of God is yours. Happy are you who are hungry now, you will be filled. Happy are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Happy are you when people hate you, reject you, insult you and say that you are evil. Because of the Son of Man. Be glad when that happens and dance for joy. Because a great reward is kept for you in heaven. For their ancestors did the very same things to the prophets. But how terrible for you who are rich now. You have had your easy life. How terrible for you who are full now. You will go hungry. How terrible for you who laugh now. 
You will mourn and weep. How terrible when all people speak well of you. Their ancestors said the very same things about the false prophets. Do you get the difference? There's a note of authority coming in now. There's not someone vaguely feeling after homespun proverbs. There's somebody saying, this is the better way. There's somebody speaking with absolute authority. Happy are you who weep. Sorrow is better than laughter. Woe to you who laugh, for you will weep. There's a note of wisdom coming through. And when Jesus had finished this kind of a sermon, do you know what he used to say? He used to say, there are two sorts of people listening to me now. There are those who are wise, who will listen to what I say and go away and do it. And they are like a wise man who's built his house on the rock. And when the crisis comes in the future, that man's life will stand. And those of you who listen to my words and do nothing about them are fools building on sand. And when the crisis comes in the future, you will tumble down. This is where wisdom is beginning to be found. And you will never read wiser words than Jesus taught. You will never find wiser proverbs than on the lips of Jesus. He speaks with a knowledge of life and an assurance. Why? I'll tell you why. Because he took the longer perspective and he looked beyond the grave and he said, Yes, insults don't hurt you. They do the opposite to you. You should rejoice because great is your reward in heaven. Take the long-term view. Not just what will I be like in old age, but what will I be like after I die if I pursue this course now? What is the ultimate outcome in eternity of what I do tomorrow, Monday morning? That's the long perspective and that's real wisdom. Real wisdom is not just considering my old age and providing for it. It is considering my life beyond old age and how I'm preparing for it. And this was the perspective that Jesus always took. But I still haven't told you where wisdom is to be found and I tell you now. It's to be found on a hill. On a hill. And you can only find wisdom on one hill in the entire world. Men dig the mountains, says Job. They dig for gold, they dig for crystals, they dig for precious stones. Beneath the fields that grow our food, they are smashing the mountain to pieces to try and find a vein of gold, to try and find something. But where shall wisdom be found? The answer is on top of one hill alone. And this afternoon I read... An amazing passage. So much did it move me that I'm going to read it to you. Listen. For the message of Christ's death on the cross is nonsense to those who are being lost. But for us who are being saved, it is God's power. The scripture says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and set aside the understanding of the scholars. So then where does that leave the wise or the scholars? All the skillful debaters of this world, God has shown that this world's wisdom is foolishness. For God in his wisdom made it impossible for people to know him by means of their own wisdom. Instead, by means of the so-called foolish message we preach, God decided to save those who believe. Jews want miracles for proof and Greeks look for wisdom. As for us, we proclaim the crucified Christ, a message that is offensive to the Jews and nonsense to the Gentiles. But for those whom God has called both Jews and Gentiles, this message is Christ who is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For what seems to be God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and what seems to be God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Now remember what you were, my brothers, when God called you. From the human point of view, very few of you were wise or powerful or of high social standing and God purposely chose what the world considers nonsense in order to shame the wise and he chose what the world considers weak in order to shame the powerful he chose what the world looks down on and despises and thinks is nothing in order 
to destroy what the world thinks is important. This means that no one can boast in God's presence. But God has brought you into union with Christ Jesus and God has made Christ to be our wisdom. That's where you find it. And poor old Ecclesiastes was groping, groping after wisdom. He knew that this was the secret to life. And I tell you, there is only one place in the world you will ever find real wisdom. And that's at the foot of the cross on a hill called Calvary outside Jerusalem. That's where you find it. That's where life begins to make sense. That's where the real meaning begins to penetrate our darkened mind. That's where you see something that looks so silly, so foolish. This perfect life being thrown away on a cross at the age of 33, that seems so mad, so crazy. And yet as you look, you see that that's God's way of putting the world right. That's the place where you discover real life. That's the place where it makes sense. That's where the world's cleverness becomes foolishness. And that's where God's foolishness is seen to be the wisest way. And real wisdom is born. And Job said, where shall it be found? You dig for things, you search for things, but where do you find wisdom? You find wisdom when you go to the foot of the cross and you look at it and say, God, my mind can't grasp it, I don't understand it, that your death, your son's death on that cross should be the means of putting the whole world right. I don't understand it. But I just know you're a very wise God. How wise of God to make it this way. You see, if he'd made it possible for men in their wisdom to find God, then philosophers would be the first into heaven. But this way, I can get in. How wise. And so God put his son on a cross and said, just come and look at that and believe that he died for you. And you've taken the first step of wisdom the wisest step you ever took in your life and the step that's going to lead on to an understanding of the ultimate outcome of everything you do. That's the long perspective. You stand at the cross and you look into eternity and at last you say, I understand. Let us pray. Oh, thank you, God, that we know where wisdom is to be found. And all the world's greatest brains have failed to arrive at that place. The great philosophers have asked their questions and propounded their theories. And all these theories go down in the history books and are then forgotten. And your cross stands. How wise you are to save us this way so that we have to bow our heads and our pride is broken we have to admit that we could never have understood unless you'd made it plain thank you that we may not be very intelligent but you can make us wise to salvation you can help the simplest person here tonight to understand what it's all about Lord, if there's anybody here who's not been to the cross and surrendered their intellect there and bowed down in love there and said sorry there, then Lord, take them tonight. We're fools until we've been there and all our ideas and all our theories are just insults to your eternal greatness thank you Lord for meeting us at the point of our deepest need thank you for lifting us above the triviality of common sense and into the depths the unsearchable depths of the wisdom of your love through Jesus Christ